Um, today's topic is water. And water is a very, very important topic because water is the number one thing we most need for our health. More so than food, we need water. And the question that many people ask themselves is, well, with so many different types of water, how do we know what's really best for us? So what to know about water, water and how to choose water that will be healthy for us. So we're going to just be learning a lot about different types of waters and how the process of cleaning and making water drinkable and safe works. So really, we should not talk about water being good and water being bad because all of the water that's labeled drinkable, so any bottle of water, and in the United States, all of the tap water is actually safe and drinkable. So, and water is so, so, so important that as long as we're getting enough of it, then we should be happy. But, as we will learn, there is a variety in quality and in taste and in how healthy it is. So, but water is very important. If I can teach you one thing today is just drink it. Drink water. More so than drinking fruit juices, more than drinking sodas, more than drinking anything else. Water is really what's most important. So what water is healthiest for me? And the truth is that there is no single answer. Um, we're constantly changing, and the water is constantly changing. So one day, a certain type of water might be better for us, and then another day, another type of water might be better for us. But going back to the first point, it's not that one is good and the other is bad. All drinkable water that is safe is good for us. So just drink it. So first let's look at where water comes from. Water is all around us. The skies are full of water. We see it in the clouds. The ocean is full of water. Rivers and lakes. When it rains the streets are full of water. Our houses have pipes that are full of water. There's water tanks everywhere. Water is just everywhere. And if we look at this image, we'll realize that below the earth that we walk on, it's also full of water. Now this isn't really uh, an accurate image. They're, what they're trying to do is show us how water is, is captured in the earth. So it's not that there's this little layer of earth and then huge amounts of water and then another layer of earth and huge amounts of water. This is just an image too. This is actually more accurate to what the earth looks like underneath. So there will be you know, big masses of earth and on the top we have mostly soil and sand and then we start getting rock. And in that rock and in the soil there are cracks everywhere. And so the water, when it r runs down, it finds its way through the sand and the soil, and it enters these cracks. And these are like pools of water. And these are what we call aquif aquifers. And so there's an important difference between the very first aquifer that is just below the surface of the ground, and then these that are under bedrock. Because this one is called an unconfined aquifer. And that means that all of the stuff that is up here, that rains down, and all the pollution in the air, and the pollution on the floor, and the garbage that we produce, and the chemicals that we use to spray our lawn, and wash our car, all of those things mix in with the water and then they filter through the soil and end up in this unconfined aquifer. 
So this one, this very first one is very, very exposed to all of the materials in our surroundings. And then, so it is, it is slightly uh, filtered because making its way through the soil and the sand, a lot of the bigger things that are in the water get trapped. So it is filtered somewhat, but there's a lot of chemicals and a lot of minerals in it that are not filtered out. Now, eventually, the water starts seeping through this, these bedrocks in the little cracks there, that there are. <clears throat> and going through a bedrock can take five years, maybe. And so for the water to go through for five years, it actually gets filtered a lot. And then it enters into this confined aquifer. And here, it's actually very, very clean. And then the water keeps going and gets to the bottom of that pool, and then it makes its way through another bedrock and gets even more filtered. And then it ends up here, and this one is even more clean than this one here. <clears throat> now that's not exclusively the case, because let's say that this bedrock has a little tiny layer of uranium or lead or mercury. You know, these are natural ele elements that you find in the earth. So that means that the water that came through here actually picked up a little bit of that lead or of that mercury and took it into the water. So in that specific case, this pool is much cleaner than this pool just because of the minerals that are around it. So, and this is a clearer uh, image of, of how it is really. So we have, you know, lakes, we have the ocean. So the ocean is salt water, and that's going to slowly but surely filter its way through here. And so some of this water here is actually salt water. And some of that salt will eventually make its way here. And so if we drill a hole and we get this water, this water is going to be slightly salty because some of the salt has mixed in. Whereas this water, we drill a hole and we take out this water, is probably not going to be salty at all. So all of this is just mixing and the water, you know, century after century is just being recycled. It's doing that process. So that's how our water kind of goes around and around and around in our world. And that's important to understand because all of those water sources eventually is where we take our water from to drink it. Now it's important to understand that the number one cause of death in the world is not cancer, is not automobile accidents. The number one cause of death in the world is drinking contaminated water. Mm -hmm. From our point of view, here in the United States, we don't see that problem on a daily basis, very, very fortunately. We have very, very good drink, access to drinkable water in the entire United States. In the exception of when there's a catastrophe, for example, when uh, Katrina, uh, was it Katrina that was in New Orleans? Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and all of that happened in New Orleans, then all of a sudden, for a couple of weeks, they didn't have drinkable water, and that became a very, very big problem. But in general, in the United States and most developed countries, this isn't an issue. But it's important to know that this is the number one cause of death in the world. So drinking, having safe drinking water is very, very important. I wanted to mention Scott Harris because he's somebody that I admire very, very, very much, who I think is doing a wonderful, wonderful work in this world. He started a charity, a nonprofit organization called Charity Water. And um, he began, he went to uh, an organization called Doctors Without Borders, and they have a ship that they traveled around Africa and they'll, 
they'll, they'll uh, stop at a port and their ship is basically a moving hospital. And so at that port, they'll get off and they'll say, we want to help people who need medical help, operations. And, and so all of these people would come and get help for free. And his job on that boat was just to be a photographer. And so he would take pictures of all of these people and the conditions they had. And slowly but surely, as he went through that process of seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of sick people and asking, what is this condition? How did this person get this? You know, why are they sick? Most of the things were, the doctors would explain is because they had, they didn't have clean drinking water. So they had gotten some kind of infection from drinking bad water. So he came back to the States and he felt very, very passionate about trying to make a difference and trying to help everybody in the world have access to safe drinking water. So it's a wonderful charity. His story and his speeches are amazing. If you want to look him up online, I highly recommend it. It's very inspirational. And of course, if you feel that you want to help in some way, um, they are always taking donations. They do a really, really fantastic work. So I wanted to mention him because that's important. So as I explained when we were looking at the image, most things are, e are either easily dissolved in water, or if they're not dissolved in water, they're carried by water. So if I say take this cup and I drink it and I walk out with it and I throw it in the parking lot, this cup doesn't just disappear, it becomes part of the atmosphere, part of the system, part of, and when it rains, the, the, the paper and the wax that has been put on this cup is going to be soaked up in the water, and the water that has been around it is going to, you know, take part of this cup with it as it dissolves and it starts rotting, and so water is everywhere but much of it is not fit to drink. And we see that very in a very extreme case when you're in the ocean, and you're on a boat, and you have nothing to drink, and you're dying of thirst because it's hot, but you're surrounded by water, yet you can't drink it because it's too salty. It's not good for us. So not all water, even though water is everywhere, is not fit to drink. Now, for water to be fit to drink and healthy, we have to clean it. And nature cleans it on, on its own through these processes of filtration. Year after year, as the water goes down through the earth, it cleans the water. But we have also learned to clean it. And what we found is that there's some natural contaminants that exist in our world, but then there's also man-made contaminants that are now in the world because we created them. And so these are the things that are not good for us that sometimes is found in the water around us. So first, we have microbiological contaminants, and this is the number one killer. This is what's really dangerous in underdeveloped countries. So children all the time are dying of diarrhea because they drink water that has some bacteria that's not good for their system. They get diarrhea, they become dehydrated, they arrive at the hospital too late or they don't have access to medical care and so they die. So microbiological contaminants, it's basically living organisms, bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungus, and they cause sickness and disease, and through that, a lot of death. There's also metals. Metals are natural to our environment. They exist in the world, lead, copper, mercury, and there's tons and tons more. But these are the three main ones that we find in the water that are not good for us, or that we find in high quantities. So mercury, for example, is now becoming a problem in fish. 
because it's more and more prominent in the ocean and fish are eating a lot more of it and it um, concentrates in the fish and then we eat the fish so we're eating high concentrations of mercury. But we also find it in water. And then we have radionuclides. So these are the things that are radioactive. Uranium, radon, and lots of other radioactive things that occur naturally in our environment. And so if there is a pool of water underground that is close to a place where they mine uranium, the uranium can get into the water and then that water is not fit to drink until we clean it. And then we have man-made contaminants. We have inorganic chemicals, and that's things that are that don't have carbon. Carbon is what determines whether something's organic or inorganic. So we have sulfates, nitrates, asbestos, which in the 50s and earlier was used very, very much in construction, and now we know it's very, very dangerous for us. But it's still around. So there are houses that have it in the walls, and when it rains and there's a cracked wall and leaks, the rain will get in there and it'll take bits of asbestos with it. So it's also in the water. Um, these things affect the nervous system. They cause blood-related illnesses and also cancer. And then we have organic chemicals and compounds, and that just means that they have carbon molecules in them. Uh, herbicides, insecticides, industrial wastes, all kinds of plastics, for example. And these things cause impaired fertility and cancer, and they're now starting to understand that it's very, very much associated to breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men. So, here we have what makes water dangerous to us. So now let's go back 2,000 years. Before they had all of this knowledge about bacteria and there were no microscopes to understand all of these things that were found in water, what did, what did they do to drink safe water? A lot of it was trial and error. Somebody would find a little pond and drink the water, and if he died, nobody else drank the water. But if he was okay, then other people drank the water. But eventually they found that alcohol cleaned water, or at least it killed whatever was living in it enough that it made it safe for us to drink. And so wine, when we read about it, for example, in the Bible, it's not always necessarily that they were drinking <coughs> straight wine, that they were drunkards. Instead, they would pour wine into water, usually in a ratio of one to eight, more or less, sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker, but the safe ratio is about one to eight if the wine is around 10% alcohol. So then the water, they would let it sit, and the alcohol in the water would kill the bacteria and the viruses, all of the living organisms that could hurt us. So that made the water safe to drink. It didn't really affect the mineral content. So if there was lead, the alcohol didn't affect that, but that's not gonna kill us immediately. If we drink water with a high level of lead, it kills us long-term, so after 10 or 20 years. Whereas the bacteria, that can kill us immediately. We'll get sick, in three days we could be dead. So that's how they dealt with purifying or cleaning or making water safe to drink. So fortunately, finding drinking water today is not a problem for most developed countries. In the US, the Safe Drinking Water Act was passed in 1974. And of course, the United States has had safe drinking water before that, but that is when the government decided we want to regulate that everybody has safe drinking water. We don't want it to be up to a city and their economy and how good technicians they have in their filtering system. We want everybody to be on an equal plane. We want everybody to have access to safe drinking water. And so that was a wonderful, wonderful thing 
for the entire United States. And basically it just set the levels for what is considered safe drinking water. So they decided, okay, well if water has this much lead in it, it's not safe to drink. If water has, you know, certain amount of concentration of bacteria, it's not safe to drink. If it has any levels of radiation, it's not safe to drink. So they just set a standard for what is acceptable and safe for us to drink. So since then, tap water is safe and healthy to drink. And we've all been enjoying good tap water for the last 30 years here in the United States. Tap water varies from place to place. So people always say New York has the best pizza. And when you ask chefs, why does New York pizza taste so good? They will say, because of the New York water. So water is a huge ingredient in making food. So of course it's gonna affect the taste of the food. Now what at New York does, as a matter of fact, have excellent, excellent, excellent drinking water. It's one of the top tap waters in the United States consistently. They have a really, really healthy, safe, controlled source that they get their water from. They filtrate it, they test it on a regular basis. They just have a really, really good system which makes their water excellent. It tastes very good, it's always consistent, it's always safe. So unless you're sick or you have a compromised immune system, you can feel safe drinking tap water. And later on we're gonna compare it to bottled water and see which one is better, tap water or bottled water, and if so, which type of bottled water. But for now, just know that drinking tap water is safe and healthy. But if you're sick, if you have cancer, if you've just been operated and your body is weak, small children, pregnant ladies, uh, people who are older, they should be a little more cautious. Now the reason that um, they need to be cautious is in tap water, there's still some things. It's very, very, very low levels, but if you have a compromised immune system, then it, those very, very small levels can still be enough to cause you harm. Whereas if you're healthy, like most of us are, our immune system, our kidney, our liver cleans the water before it goes into our system and we have no problem with it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So to understand the types of water, because there's so many different types of water, I'm going to go through and explain what all of these types of water are exactly and where it comes from. So first we have well water. Now everybody's seen a picture of what a well looks like. It's just a round thing with rocks and you throw a coin in and you listen and it goes bloop. So there's water that comes from under the surface of the earth. And they dug a deep hole, deep enough that it gets to one of these underwater pools that's constantly being refilled. So a well can be an eternal source of water. And as long as you keep the well protected and covered, that if that water is a healthy source of water, it can be an eternal source of healthy water. Now, if you had a good well and some company, some chemical company, buys a property and it starts manufacturing some kind of oil products and they don't care about the environment and they start pouring out all these chemicals into the rivers around, eventually those rivers are what filters down through the earth into this well. And so 20 years from now, you could find that this well, which was healthy drinking water, is no longer fit because it's full of chemicals. So that's the first one, well water. Artesian water is well water that comes from a confined aquifer. So this one comes from a non-confined. It's that first pool that I talked about. So it's the least filtrated. But if we have healthy water, 
just a little amount of filtration is good enough. And so well water is usually good, good to drink. Whereas artesian water, it means that you've dug even deeper. And you've gotten past these first pools, and then you've dug through the rocks and gotten to these confined pools. So artesian water is usually much, much cleaner. We have spring waters, and these come from the underground water sources, but through cracks in the earth and pressure from the earth, this water springs up naturally to the surface of the earth. And so, and it's always springing up, so we're always getting fresh water coming through the earth out to the surface. So these, these waters are very, very clean usually. Spring waters are excellent and usually very, very clean. Now we have sparkling water, and we think that that's produced in some factory somewhere, that they take water, they push bubbles into it, and then they bottle it and close it quickly so that the bottle, bubbles don't escape, and then we open it and it goes pssst, and then we drink it. Actually, nature creates sparkling water. <laughs> so there are places where water is coming through the cracks because of the pressure of the earth, and it's coming up, but there's geothermal heat sources that as the water's coming up, it pressurizes it, so it forces carbon dioxide into the water, and when it comes up, it comes up sparkling. So the very first bottled water company that is still around is Perrier. And Perrier, they own one of the most famous and best sources of sparkling water. So basically, they just take the water that's coming up from the ground, bottle it up, close it, and sell it to you. And then you open it up and it's full of fizz. And it's the earth that's done that. So that's what sparkling water is. Um, then there's natural water. So that comes from groundwater sources, but not from a treatment center, a municipal treatment center. So for example, groundwater can be a lake or a river. All of those are considered natural water. Then we have purified water. It comes from the surface of the, of the earth. Uh, like a lake or a river. So the difference between natural water... Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, actually a groundwater source is under the earth. So this is a lake and a river, whereas natural water... So for example, a well is also considered natural water. Artisanal water is also considered natural water. It's water that is under the earth and has not been processed by us humans. <clears throat> Whereas purified water comes from the surface of the earth, like a lake or a river, and that has to be pure, clean before we drink it. And then we have tap water, which is what we've been talking about, comes from all different sources. So our tap water comes from wells, it comes from artisanal wells, it comes from springs, it comes from rivers, lakes, all kinds of sources. We take that water depending on our environment, and then we purify it, and that's where we get tap water. And that's not it. We still have more types of water. So we have mineral water, and that just means that it's water that contains minerals. So it contains magnesium, contains calcium, contains sodium, all kinds of minerals. We have distilled water, which contains no minerals whatsoever. So this we could say is the purest type of water, is distilled water. And so you ask, well, if it's the purest type of water, should I be drinking distilled water all the time? If you're sick, probably yes. But otherwise, no, because part of what we're drinking when we drink water is minerals that our body needs. We need calcium, we need sodium, we need magnesium on a regular basis. So we don't want to be drinking distilled water which has no minerals whatsoever because we're actually missing a part of what we're getting when we're drinking water. <coughs> However, as I mentioned before, 
People who have a weak health, for some reason or other, they are recommended to drink distilled water at least for a, part, a, a certain time, amount of time, while they are weak and recovering. <coughs> then we have reverse osmosis water. Reverse osmosis is just a very, very high level of filtration. It's not used on a regular basis. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of time to do reverse osmosis. But if you want really, really clean water, then there is something called reverse osmosis water, which you can get. And that, for example, is used very much with children. So if there is you know, a specific type of bottled water that's taken to nurseries, very often it's reverse osmosis <coughs> water, just because it's really, really clean. And then there's ozonated water, which is water that's been treated with ozone, which is basically a type of oxygen, but instead of it being two oxygen molecules, it's three oxygen molecules. Ozone happens naturally, and the top of our atmosphere is covered with ozone, and it actually protects us from the rays of the sun. But ozone happens actually on the surface of the earth. When the rays of the sun come down and they hit the surface of the earth, one of the byproducts of that is that oxygen molecules will combine and become o ozone instead of oxygen. And these are much lighter, so what do they do? They just float up to the top of our atmosphere, and that's why our atmosphere is covered in ozone. Because these ozone particles that are created on the surface of the earth just go up, because they're much lighter than oxygen. So, but you can take ozone, and you can press it into water, and it has the same effect of killing the bacteria that wine or alcohol does. So that's a way to also clean water, is using ozone to, to kill the bacteria. Um, as well as chloride. So we know about chlorinated. You put chlorine in your pool to clean the water. It kills all of the bad bacteria, and then you can swim in it. So that's another way that we clean waters through the use of chlorine. So it's important to know that when we're drinking water, we're not just getting H2O, we're not just getting water, we're actually drinking many minerals that are vital, vital, vital to our daily functioning. And we're also getting bacteria that is essential for our health. Our skin is covered in bacteria. Our digestive tract is full of bacteria. Some of it good, some of it bad. And it's that balance that keeps us healthy. So when we're drinking water, we're actually drinking many, many minerals and a certain level, a certain very, very low level of bacteria, and all of that is really important for us. Water with low mineral content is not ideal. We were talking about distilled water. It's very, very pure. And you can drink it, and it's safe to drink in an, an emergency situation, but if you're always drinking distilled water, you're missing out on a lot of the other benefits of regular water. So distilled water has no minerals, no bacteria, so drinking it on a regular basis is a bad choice. It's used mostly for people with compromised immune system. So it's important to know that we can get many minerals from salt. And that is why I always recommend using sea salt. If you have regular table salt at home, use up that can and never buy it again. It's very, it's very processed, it's not healthy, and it actually doesn't taste so good. Once you start cooking with sea salt, it's more expensive, absolutely, once you start cooking with sea salt, you're going to realize that your food tastes so much better. So that's one of the chef's top 10 secrets for good tasting food. If you ask a chef, what are your secrets to make things taste good? They'll tell you, I use butter. They'll say, I use shallots, which are these little tiny types of onions which taste delicious. They'll say the water that you use is very important. But they'll also say, the salt that you use is very important. 
So always use sea salt. And that's another good source of getting all of these minerals that we need, as well as all of the fruits and vegetables that we eat on a regular basis. So just a little side note about salt. So there's two controversies that surround tap water. The first one is chloride. We put chlorine in our tap water to kill bacteria. That means that we're getting chlorine in our system when we drink tap water. That is true. But there are very, very, very low levels. However, there are people that say, who are purists, and say, I don't want to have any foreign chemicals in my body. And that's OK. Everybody has the right to that. But there's a lot of studies, and in the many, many years that we've been drinking chlorinated water, they still haven't been able to prove that it has substantial negative effects. If Instead of drinking tap water, which has really low levels of chlorine, every morning you went out to your swimming pool and you took a glass and you drink that, and you did that for 40 years, that would be harmful for you. Because the level of chlorine in your pool water is very, very, very high. The level in tap water is extremely low. The other thing is fluoride. Now fluoride is actually less controversial than chlorine because fluoride happens naturally in nature. And there's places like North Dakota, Texas, Arizona, and Alaska where there's a lot of fluoride in the earth. There's huge um, deposits of fluoride. So the water obviously goes through the earth and ends up in these underwater pools, and when they pull it up, it has high levels of fluoride. And so, um, it was actually in Belgium. So the question is, why do we put fluoride in our tap water? They discovered in Belgium that there was a certain city where everybody had really, really good teeth. And in the rest of Belgium, people didn't have really such good teeth. They had yellow teeth, and they'd have teeth problems, and they'd have to pull them out. But this one city had excellent teeth, everybody, consistently. And they thought, this is really strange. And so they started trying to figure out what it was. And they discovered that their city had a huge deposit of fluoride, and so they were drinking water that had high levels of fluoride. Or not high levels, but significantly more than most other places. And they found that that fluoride actually helped their teeth be much stronger and healthier. And so they decided, well, why don't we put fluoride in other people's water and see if it helps them? And so they started testing it. And sure enough, if they put very small amounts of fluoride in other people's water, their teeth got much, much better. And eventually they passed a law that said, in all of Belgium, we're going to put fluoride in all of the water so that everybody has healthy teeth. And the United States and England and a lot of other countries followed suit. So that's why we have fluoride in the tap water. In Alaska, there was a huge controversy. There are a lot of people who are very purist there, and they believe in their health and want to be cautious. And they actually realized, we already have quite a bit of fluoride in our water. Why are we going to be required by law to add more? We think that's dangerous for us. And so they actually won, and they don't put fluoride in their water. But because they already have fluoride in their water, so it's unnecessary to have more. So those are the two controversies that come up time and time again. The <clears throat> truth is, we still don't know how chlorine affects us. You know, but some people have lived 90, 100 years drinking tap water with chlorine, and it's been OK. So there's still a level of uncertainty, which is why it's controversial. But certainly, the benefits outweigh the known drawbacks. The benefits are that we can consistently have safe drinking water for every single inhabitant in the United States. And that's a huge benefit. Yes? I did want to bring up those two controversies, because they're important to know about. So now let's change our shift to bottled water. Oh, so the other thing that I just want to mention quickly is if you do drink tap water, 
my recommendation also is to filter it. You can buy, you know, small one-time filters or uh, like a little filter jar, or you can actually have a filter installed in your refrigerator, which you get water from, or directly in your on your faucet, and it filters the water coming out. There's a lot of variety of filters. So there's filters that make your water alkaline as well. As not only does it filter it, but it helps make it alkaline. Those are also very good. My for my research and all of the studies and I've read and knowledge that I have, most filters that cost more than $50 are relatively good. They do what's important. They take out any foul odors that the tap water might have. They filter some of the chloride out. They filter any minerals that maybe got into your tap water through the pipe system. So I would recommend if you drink tap water, and I do that, on a regular basis, I use a filter to filter it. So, but now let's look at bottled water. <clears throat> so drinking water way, way back was obtained from rivers, from springs, from common wells, and sold <coughs> in the markets in big clay jars. So if you went to a marketplace, you would find fruits and vegetables and sheep and goats, but you would also find people who had these big, big jars and they were full of water and you'd come by with a little jar and they would fill it up with their good water and you'd take it home and you'd use that for cooking and so on and so forth. So that's really the start of bottled water. It wasn't bottled per se, but it was collected by somebody from a safe source. He'd bring it to the city and then other people would buy it from him. But then there was also these places of holy waters so somebody would say, there is this spring in southern Spain that if you drink that water, if you, have, if you have severe headaches all the time, and you drink that water, you're cured of your headaches. And so people started thinking, wow, this is amazing, miraculous water. Well, it wasn't really miraculous water necessarily. It was that that spring had water with high levels of potassium, say. And some people get headaches because they have low levels of potassium in their body. So if you drink water with high levels of potassium and you get headaches because you have low levels of potassium, of course, your body gets the minerals it needs and the headaches go away. So it's not miracu miraculous in that sense that it's a supernatural thing. But back then when we didn't know so much about all of these minerals that our bodies need, it felt miraculous. And so people would make these pilgrimages, and they would build a big church next to the spring, and people would come, and they would pray, and they would drink the water, and then they'd walk home, and they didn't have a headache anymore. And it was wonderful. So of course, there was a business to be had. And so people started putting these holy waters in jars for people who couldn't come all the way here. They started sending them away. They said, this is the holy water from south of Spain. Drink it and your headaches will go away. So that is the birth of bottled water. It was first the gathering of these holy waters, which were just natural spring waters that had certain minerals that were good for us. And so they'd bottle them and send them away. So what is bottled water by definition here in the United States? It's water that meets all federal and state safe drinking water standards. And those water standards are basically the 1974 Safe Drinking Water Act standards. And then this water that meets all of those standards is sealed in a sanitary container, basically a plastic bottle. And it's been done in a plant that is clean and safe so that nothing's gotten in there. And when you open it at home, you have a good quality water. That's it. Nothing more. They haven't treated it in any special way. You could basically get tap water and bottle it because that meets all of the standards of federal and state laws and put a lid on it and sell it. And as a matter of fact, some companies do that. 
pretty much. So is it true? We'll find out. We don't always meet this definition of bottled water. That's the regulation. That's what the law intends. But that's not always the case. So in 1975, the FDA began re regulating bottled water. And they used the same standards as the 1974 Safe Water Drinking Act. So <clears throat> bottled water does not have to be any different, any safer, any cleaner than tap water. But there's an extra thing. They allowed, the FDA, allowed companies to be mostly self-regulated, self-monitored. Mm -hmm. Whereas municipalities, they are ob obligated to send in tests on a regular basis and say, this test was done on the 10th of December. This is from a sample of our pool of 10 million gallons. And these are the results. It's clean. Excellent. Keep doing what you're doing. Bottled water companies can regulate themselves. So they can do a test whenever they want, when they have time. They're very, very busy bottling this water. So they don't always have time to test it. So this, I think, is a problem. Whenever you allow an industry to self-regulate it, the standards go down. So coming back to New York tap water, New York tap water is tested 330 times a year. That's almost every 24 hours. Some companies that produce bottled water regulate it once a year. We haven't tested our bottled water in, what was it, 11 months? I think it's time. So they test it and it's good. So they keep going. With these standards, which do you think is going to be better? Probably the New York water, because every single day they're making, at least not necessarily better, but at least more consistent. Every day consistently. Yeah. Before the act, 1974, and coming from New York, and there was a lot of complaints about the water and the way it tasted. Yeah. I remember to this day, they had a news, <clears throat> one of the talk shows, they had a news um, investigation about, about the water. And they had one of the congressmen, councilmen, whoever. And they held up the water to the uh, camera to show the little things that were crawling around in it. Oh, and he said it was perfectly safe. And I remember to this day, there were little things, they magnified. And they said, do you really think this is safe? And they said, yeah, fine, but will you drink it? And he would not drink it yeah. on TV. So, so that was before that. Yeah. Even after the 1974 Safe Drinking Water Act, there are <clears throat> outbreaks of, you know, there, for example, the Miami-Dade water system. Some teenager could climb the fence and pour in a bucket of mud water. And so all of a sudden, the water in the Miami-Dade system is contaminated until this mud water that he poured in goes through the system. So Miami Data is obliged, if that happens, to contact the federal government and notify them that this has happened, and make a public announcement to us and say, for the next two weeks, do not drink tap water because it's been contaminated. Or if they do a test and they find that all of a sudden they don't understand why, but their system is, is not clean, it, then they at advise us, do not drink the tap water. So that happens from time to time. It's not so common anymore, but it's, it's a, interesting. So when they do blind taste tests between bottled water and New York water nowadays, they say, we're going to give you two types of water. We're not going to tell you what is what. Taste it and just tell us what you think, which one you like better. New York water very, very often wins. So it's excellent, excellent water. So levels of harmful chemicals and metals that exceed the amounts that are designated to be safe are regularly found in bottled water. So there are outside investigative groups that say, OK, we're going to buy 50 different types of bottled water, and we're going to test it all. And when they do that, often or sometimes they find that you know, there's high levels of whatever, calcium in this water that exceed what we think is safe. So 
bottled water, unfortunately, is not as safe as we think. We see it, it's sealed, we think that's good, but it's not as regulated as our tap water. So it's not as consistently safe and healthy as our tap water. Even Perrier, which is considered to be among the best water, sometimes or there was this huge ordeal in the 80s when they tested Perrier, because there was a, an investigative group that was doing some kind of water test, and they said, well, the best water is Perrier, so let's use that as our standard. And they opened the bottle, and they tested it, and they found really high levels of uh, benzene, which is a oil byproduct chemical. And so they were like, what? And so they notified Perrier, and they notified the government, and Perrier made a recall of all their bottles, and it was a huge, huge scandal. But that happens. So just because it's bottled does not necessarily mean it's safe. So 75% of bottled water, water comes from protected and uncontaminated natural springs and wells, these deeper pools in the earth. So some companies own water rights to a certain area, geographic area, and those pools underground, they access them, they pull out that water and they bottle it for us. And those are clean. 25% of bottled water just comes from municipal tap facilities. So it's somebody who says, I'm going to start a bottled water company, and they just open the tap and they start pouring it into the bottle, and then they seal it and they sell it to you. That's the way it is. All of the bottled water that comes from the company's Coke and Pepsi are US tap water that's been treated just slightly. What they do is they <clears throat> Filter it again so that it's filtered and clean, but they already know because it's tap water, it meets all of the standards. And then they add a little bit of minerals to it just to neutralize the taste. And so the taste is consistent in all of these bottles of water. But it's basically tap water. And this is what they're doing. They're selling you a 12, 12 ounce bottle of water for $1.50. And then they take that $1.50 and they buy a thousand gallons of tap water and then they fill up another bottle and sell it to you for $1.50. So it's a pretty good business that they've got going. Some designer bottle of water are marked up 280,000%. It seems ridiculous. But if we think about it, paying $1.50 for a 12 ounce bottle of water is actually ridiculous. That water costs that company less than a cent less than one penny to produce. And they're selling it for $1.50. I have a business where I make healthy meals. And so I was thinking about this and I thought, maybe I should make designer lunches. <laughs> so if I marked up my lunch 280,000%, one of my lunches would be just under a million dollars. It'd be about $895,000 for one lunch. So markup on bottled water is absurdly ridiculous. It's important for us to just be aware of it. A curiosity that I found online, Evian spelled backwards is naive. <laughs> Give it some thought. I don't know if it was intentional on their part. So the main benefit we get from bottled water is consistent taste. They get rid of odors, they put in minerals to neutralize the taste. All of the bottles of water are going to consistently taste the same. At your home, when you open the tap, one day the water might taste fantastic, and then the next day it might taste a little bit off. It's still healthy to drink. You're not going to get sick from it. You're not getting high levels of anything. But it's not always consistent. So a lot of people buy bottled water just because they like that consistent taste, and that's fine. But tap water is consistently safer and healthier for you to drink. Remember, I recommend that even if you're drinking tap water, filter it. It's just an extra step of precaution. It's best to filter your tap water. It just provides extra healthy, extra safety in case there was to be some situation at the filtering facility, and we weren't informed until a couple hours later. 
long as you're always filtering your tap water is safe to drink. And then another secret that bottled water people know is that aerated water tastes better. So what they do with their water before putting it in the bottles is they put it high up and then they let it splash down. And there's lots of air that gets into the water and that just naturally makes it taste better. And after that, they'll put it in the water. So if, you're, if you one day don't like the taste of your tap water, we'll just fill up a jug and then take pour another it. jug and just pour it from high up and then it's going to taste better. So aerated water tastes better. So you can aerate your tap water in case it's not tasting so good. This is my business. I make healthy vegetarian lunches for people who are in downtown Brickell, Midtown, or South Beach. Hopefully someday I can expand to include coconut uh, coral gables. And then this is our website, Cancer Prevention and Recovery. Every month we have a different topic. We always have information about when the meeting is, what day, what we're going to be talking about. And if you go to events, you can see all of the lectures from previous months. We started in February, so now this is our 10th lecture. So thank you so much.